so I guess everybody here really knows knows length, but anyway, I, I think it, it's a good start to just remind everybody what links is. Um, there isn't really that much different, actually, to, to organization like France IX, mutually owned by our members. Um, and the main goal is really facilitate interconnection between, between our members. Um, nothing, nothing new. Lynx has been around for, for quite a while. Um, I think we're going to be 20 years next year. So um, I've been, have been around for quite a while. And the network as such has evolved quite, quite a lot as well. <clears throat> and again, just I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to spend more time on, on the technical stuff at, at, uh, in this presentation. But just a reminder of what, what you can find at Lynx if you connect to Lynx. If you aren't there, you really should be there. Um, but, but again, no, no big surprises there. Um, interesting numbers in regards to how many of our members actually have uh, an open peering policy. Um, or, well, that doesn't seem to work that great, does it? Um, have a, uh, so 60% have an open peering policy. So even if you, if you just go there and connect uh, a single BGP session to our route servers, um, you actually get already a significant amount of traffic and a significant amount of, uh, number of, of routes um, on links without having to go through what sometimes can be trouble of establishing the P sessions one by one. Um, the other thing, again, no surprises there. So we offer remote connections. Links from anywhere is the old program which, which has been around for uh, quite a number of, of uh, years where we simply work together with a number of layer two carriers um, who can make it very easy for you to, to get your router um, long haul back to London. And then more recently, connections, um, which is uh, an even way to, um, for you to have a remote connection uh, back to, back to links where it's going to be terminated over VLANs on the partners, on the connection partners port. Uh, again, no surprises. They are pretty much um, standard, standard things these days. Again, yes. Okay, let's switch over to one of these. Okay, um, so this one, obviously, whenever you take it, it's never going to be up to date, but it, it shows you, it gives you quite quite a nice overview of, of where our members are, uh, a pretty global reach. Um, there's really just South America, which for whatever reason, um, we don't seem to have anybody there. Um, now let's, let's talk about why I'm, why I'm really here, the, the technical side of links, the architecture, um, and some of the things which are different that, that we at links are doing different. So we're running two lands in parallel in, in London, um, and we've been doing that since a couple of years. And both LANs, they actually were using two different vendors even. One is currently based on Juniper uh, Networks equipment, and the second one is based on Extreme Networks. The Juniper LAN has traditionally been the, the larger one. It's, it's, we have a, a, a bit more traffic on that one, which is why we start with the introduction of 100 gig on, on Juniper, and Extreme will probably follow later. It also comes a little bit that Extreme is a bit behind on actually making 100 gig ports available on their equipment. Um, you currently can't buy any. The first Extreme equipment, um, the Black Diamond series, is going to be out only, um, hopefully, um, early next year. We'll, we'll see. But we'll focus on, on Juniper for now. Um, the architecture, we, we introduced Juniper into our network three years ago now. Um, initially, it was purely based on uh, MX960s, MX480s. From day one, it was a VPLS architecture, very straightforward. Um, a couple of VPLS instances, one for unicast, multicast. Um, no, nothing, nothing really special there. Things became more interesting when we introduced the PTX series um, last year, before the Olympics. Uh, the reason why we went for it is simply we needed... Um, a bit higher density in, in regards to 10 gig ports and, and really also growth capability in, in the core that the MX at the time, especially the 960s, couldn't really offer us. And the price per port is also a bit more efficient on the PTX series. Um, this is the overview of, of, of the network as it, as it looks by now. 
Um, it, you can't really see it that great in there, but it's, it's a core in the middle. It's more like a cube than an actual ring. So we have two core routers in, in four sites um, across London, um, and then a number of edge routers, which are normally MX960s, PE routers, and uh, some of the ones in the core are simply P routers, which are the, the PTXs. Um, where are we going to put 100 gig in, in the core? Maybe before I go there, we, we have, since before the Olympics, we have a single member which is connected on 100 gig. Um, there are a few more which are in the pipeline now. I think one is in the process of being provisioned. The member is even in the room. So that should be up fairly, fairly soon. Um, and there are two more which are in the pipeline. So it, it, we, we really seem to see slowly demand picking up for members to actually move to 100 gig instead of accumulating 10 gig ports. But what we're talking about today is really doing 100 gig in the core, which is um, at a slightly different level. Um, so where we're going to start it first, let's go on back, is really um, these core links, um, and, and it's really interconnecting the PTXs. So this is between Telehouse North, for those who, who know the sites in London, and Telehouse West. Um, the second step will be to upgrade some of our P routers in Telehouse East, also to 100 gig. And that's in that case between MX 960s and PTX. Now the question that I'm sure a lot of people ask, well, why do you move to 100 gig? It is still expensive. Why, why do you take the step now? Why don't you wait a little bit longer? Um, and there is quite an easy explanation. It's really just to scale it. So this is um, a slightly different view of the network. And to explain um, a little bit more how it actually, how, how the network really looks. And both of these graphs actually look fairly simple. There are not that many links in there. Um, that should be easy to handle. Uh, well, as I mentioned, this is a simplified view. In reality, the network looks like this. Um, and um, if, we, if we go in there, so it's, it's quite a few 10 gig ports which are in this network. And it simply goes to a point where it doesn't really scale um, to add more and more 10 gig ports um, to these bundles. It gets even more complicated that by the fact that using the PTX is a nice thing. It's a very, a very interesting platform, um, interesting cost-wise, uh, interesting from a port density or growth in the future. Um, but it has limitation in its current generation. It is a pure MPLS switch. Um, and, and it really is that. Um, it will change over the future, but at the moment, the current generation of the PTX it really can only look at MPLS labels, and it can only do that even if you want to do load balancing. Now, if you have this number of 10 gig links between uh, nodes, you need to have very, very good load balancing in order to get any useful uh, utilization out of these links, um, which really led us to change the design quite, quite dramatically and, and instead of uh, using a single pair of LSPs between each PE router, we actually have 32, in reality 64, 32 primaries and 32 secondary LSPs. And each of these LSPs is, is uh, nailed down with a strict pass on the individual 10 gig links throughout the network. And that's really where our problem comes from. So currently we run two times 32 by 10 between the core routers if we would want to continue increasing that on 10 gig basis, we would need to continue to increase the number of LSPs, um, and it just becomes a network that becomes more and more complex. And as Francais also has learned, complexity is not a good thing to have. Keep it simple um, is really the goal. So that's really one of our main motivations. The other motivation is that the prices are actually by now at a level where it becomes interesting to look at it. The, the second reason why, which makes it commercially more interesting, the way we currently do the 10 gig based um, connections between these sites, we do passive DWDM like so many others. But we're running 32 times 10 gig links um, over that. So that's a lot of, a lot of fiber. Um, it's a lot of DWDM optics, which aren't that cheap either. Um, it all adds up fairly quickly. So 100 gig cost-wise by now, 
if you can push your vendor hard enough, actually doesn't look too bad anymore. Um, so that's what it's going to look like after we have completed the 100 gig link. So instead of having 64 links, we're just going to have 6 times 100, times 2, 12 times 100. Um, and that's what we're currently doing. Um, we, we are currently, these weeks, um, going through it and actually implementing it. Um, we're in the lucky situation that we can build it completely in parallel to the 10 gig based infrastructure. So we have a nice backup plan in case anything goes wrong. Um, and we do it really as, as careful as we can and, and hopefully without causing any, any service interruption for our members in, uh, uh, who are connected on, on our LAN. So far, the first steps have gone um, quite, quite nicely. Uh, we have implemented four times 100. We'll do two more later on. Four times 100 gig between all of the PTXs, um, which we have done two weeks ago. And funny enough, it, it actually really just, just works. It's, it's nice to see if things works. work. What is the equipment that we use? As I mentioned, we're using the two port cards on the PTX, so it gives us four ports per slot. Slightly less good use of the, the actual slots on the PTX. On 10 gig based, on, on the current generation cards, we could do 24 by 10, um, meaning 48 10 gigs per slot, so we lose a bit of capacity on the PTX. That will change next year with the next generation cards, but it is what's available now. On the MX, well, nicer from, from a point of view of capacity per slot. So we're using MPC4 cards, um, which gives us two times 100 gig per slot, um, which clearly is better than, than the current uh, 16 by 10 based cards that we use for 10 gig on, on the MX. The disadvantage of using the MPC4 cards, and everybody in here who uses Juniper, it, it means you need to run fairly recent Junos 12.3. With all the fun that that brings with it, um, it, it um, even though there were a lot of promises, I hope there's nobody from Juniper in the room, there were a lot of promises that, um, no, 12.3 is going to be perfect. You can release R1, you can use it. We have changed everything, and it's so good. Um, well, that didn't work, did it? Um, we're actually running um, R2, funny enough. Uh, we, we, we did our testing on R3. Um, that was a bit of a uh, not such a positive result. We found a couple of uh, pretty nasty defects in, in uh, R3. Um, we haven't bothered testing R4 since it only came out last week. It was too late. Um, so we actually have chosen to go for our 2S4, um, which actually seems to, so far, knock on wood, if we have any wood, um, is behaving quite fine. On, in regards to optics, transceivers, we're using, and that's purely cost reasons, we're using SR10 between the PTXs, which are in the same sites. Um, so we, we do SR10, but no ODFs, no, no patching in between. It's a direct patch lead between the transceivers to keep it simple. And I will explain why in a second, um, why it was important to keep that simple. And then we do LR4 um, between Telehouse North and Telehouse West and Telehouse West and Telehouse East. So no DWDM at the moment involved, single pair of dark fiber for each 100 gig link. And since all of these links are within the Telehouse campus, it is financially not, not, a, big, not a big deal um, to do so. And I mentioned most of that. So four times 100 gig are in, in service um, since, since two weeks now, working fine, working really as expected. Um, and we actually will be bringing the first 100 gig links to the Amexes into service um, tonight. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> um, but hopefully by mid-October, so in the next two weeks, we'll be completely done and um, have all the work completed. What have we learned so far? Um, 
It really it just works. Um, that's a graph of um, showing the four times 100 between some of the PTXs, so currently running around 40 gig on each one of the links. Um, so 100, 160 gig in, in total at the moment, peak over, over those links. Uh, and and no, no issue, nothing, nothing to, to complain about. The important thing, if you didn't know it, clean your fiber. Um, you might get away with being a bit sloppy on 10 gig. You won't get away with being sloppy on 100 gig. It's going to hurt you bad. Uh, make sure you clean them, you check them, you clean them. Um, since it will it will hurt you, it is it is picky. The other probably the the, the biggest the biggest issue um, are transceivers these days. The um, 100 gig SR10 based transceivers, at least the ones that Juniper provides you these days, which are actually finished optics, um, they work fine. Um, but they're a bit useless for troubleshooting since, well, SR10, for those who don't know it, actually what it does, it's 10 by 10. Um, so it's 10 um, individual. The, the, the patch lead that you use actually um, in, in reality has 24, but only 12 of the fibers are used. Uh, sorry, 20 of the fibers, 10 pairs are being used um, for, for that. So there are 10 different lasers in each of these optics. Um, and normally you are used that you have pretty decent diagnostics on your transceivers and you can actually see the light levels um, on, on the laser. On, on the count one, it would be one laser. On SR10, it would be 10 lasers. Well, the count generation of Finisar SR10 optics shows you zero all the time. It just doesn't show any, um, any measurements and the answer from Juniper and Finisize, yeah, we didn't really have time to implement that. <laughs> um, so be careful which one you buy. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's early days, really, for, for those things. Um, but it was one of the reasons why it was important that the SR10 part, that we don't go through any, any patch panels, through any ODFs, anything. It's really just a pure uh, direct patch lead. Um, so we're fairly confident that actually it's not going to hurt us. We're never going to touch them um, unless we have to, to replace the card or anything. Um, it's it's going to be fine. And um, the the other thing, of course, it's SR10. It's it's an uh, MPO connector, so make sure you have a cleaning kit that can clean those connectors. Um, it looks much better on the LF4 um, optics where you have four lasers, uh, as it's doing four times 25 gig. Um, there, at least, Finisa decided to actually implement the necessary um, tools for, for users to use, so you can see uh, your transmit and receive signals on, on those. But otherwise, it, it, really, it really just works. Um, it, it really just goes with uh, the same experience we had when we brought the first 100, mem 100 gig member port up into service last year. Um, that was on, on MPC3 cards, but again, it, it worked from, from day one, which is the only positive thing. I think the only, the only scary thing is that 100 gig, it's actually even too small these days, um, since the fact that we start to deploy them with four times 100, actually six times 100, actually shows that we're too far behind. We actually would like to have something bigger uh, instead of just 100 gigs, since the fact that we need to bundle them on day one together is, is not a very good start. Um, but it is what it is. Um, 400 gig is still quite far away. And um, one terabit per second, I don't think they have found a way to do it yet. Um, so 100 gig it is. And I think that's pretty much Pretty much all I have to say. Any any questions? Any any anybody wants any more details about this? Um. Hi, Mathieu Vanessa. A quick question. I guess you're running VPLS on top of it. Yes. Any plan of running eVPN since it's now available on uh, 13 and 2 and Juniper, and bring some more security, especially on the exchange? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I see the point of more security. Um, I. Mm, it, we definitely have plans in, in regards to future projects to, um, to, uh, to see what we can do and make, make, in the end, make better use of the capability that the network has. 
the fact that it is a VPLS network. The, the main reason at the time when we moved to it, funny enough, the main reason before we had Junible, we had Brocade, and we had a lot of trouble with it at the time. Um, it was the, the good old Brocade MRP, which really was um, pretty much a pain. So the main reason initially to go to VPLS, get more flexibility, get a, a known proven uh, protocols. Um, but we clearly have it always in the back of our, of our heads to, to see, um, to implement other services that, that make good use of, of the underlying um, architecture, the fact that it is a VPLS network. So th there will be things to come, but I don't think there's anything I can talk about at the moment. Anybody else? In that case, thank you.